Okay, so now we are on to our um, Divisional XI Science Awards, and Dr. Lewis is going to help me present these. All right, first up, we have our Exercise Science Academic Excellence Award. The Exercise Science Excellence Award is given to the graduating senior with the highest GPA and is exemplified academic excellence within the undergraduate exercise science program. This year's award recipient is Naomi Eckert Rivera. show on the road. So we're on an honor to be able to do this. I'm so proud of how hard each of these seniors worked literally for the entire year on these capstones. So first let's get started with Naomi Eckert Rivera. The title of her um, capstone is the effect of resistance exercise on symptoms of spine osteoarthritis. Naomi? about 80% of Americans have an episode of low back pain during their lifetime. 
OA is one of the most common form of osteoarthritis, and it is ranked um, top 10 causes of disabilities worldwide. Furthermore, as Dr. Lewis, uh, Dr. Lewis and Lachowski mentioned, chiropractic is the field of study I am most interested in, and it is a, it is a belief that the body can heal itself, meaning that I chose this topic because um, it's interesting to me how you can heal the body without pharmacological substances, which is the field of study I'm interested in. And furthermore, as an exercise science student, we believe that exercise is medicine, meaning that as I will talking as I will be talking about it, exercise is proven to be beneficial for symptoms, and it's my English word. <laughs> so furthermore, OA is a degenerative form of joint arthritis involving articular surfaces. It is it gets worse um, over time, meaning that it's a debilitating condition that causes pain and restriction of motion. Major risk factors for this disease is the increasing of age. Um, joint injury, mechanical overuse, and obesity. Furthermore, um, spinal A can be defined as the presence of disc degeneration and osteophyte formation. Osteophyte formation being bony growths around um, the vertebra or the joint itself. This causes um, the disc between a healthy vertebrae, which you can see on the top right, to narrow on the top on the bottom. You can see the osteoarthritis spine and the disc narrowing and as well as the osteophyte formation. This degeneration causes, as mentioned before, the osteophyte and facet joint osteoarthritis, which we will be able to see in the next slide, as well as the disc phase narrowing. Um, this is all due to the healthy joint cartilage and the extracellular um, matrix changing. So in a, chondrocytes are responsible for producing the cartilage. They build the cartilage and they become embedded in it. In healthy individuals, chondrocytes um, maintain homeostasis um, by producing anabolic and catabolic um, processes, meaning that they build and they break down cartilage. In a osteoarthritis individual, chondrocytes produce more catabolic activity, meaning that it breaks down more cartilage, causing um, the joints to be narrower, narrower and more together, causing pain and restriction of motion. Why does this happen? It is unknown, but um, eventually with time also, these chondrocytes will wear out and begin to process known as apoptosis or programmed cell death, which makes the cartilage weaker and loose in elasticity. So once again, as patients age, the functional integrity of the spine deteriorates, meaning that there's going to be alterations of load-bearing forces. This predisposes um, the patient to those alter alterations of load-bearing forces and causes the posterior spine to bear an increased load in the subchondral sub bone density and start increasing with osteophyte formation. So you can see on the top right a healthy vertebra with the fascia joints on the right and an osteoarthritic spine where the, where the joint begins to get osteophyte formation in that bony growth and the disc space starts narrowing. So just the fact, um, in a healthy spine, typically these fascia joints carry about 33% of the load, but as the facet joint and the intervertebral disc degeneration develops, they begin to hold about 70% of the load. This creates more pain and more pressure to those, to those areas. So for my review of literature, the major concepts that I'm gonna be discussing are in knee osteoarthritis. There was a, a gap in the literature, which is why I chose this topic for spine, and I'm gonna be, my, my studies are mainly on knee osteoarthritis. So for the first one, it was titled Comparative Efficacy of Eccentric and Concentric Focus Resistance Exercise on Pain, Leg Strength, and Walking Endurance on Knee Osteoarthritis. This was a 16-week um, training or supervised training program that included 90 participants ranging from 60 to 85 years of age. It consisted of three groups, a concentric resistance training group, an eccentric resistance training group, and a no exercise control group. They define as they define concentric as pushing the weight the weight away from the body and eccentric with a controlled weight return back to the body. Furthermore, they use traditional weight machines for the concentric um, resistance training group, and they use modified match machines for the eccentric resistance training group. This machine to the right is an example of the machine they use. It's a Medex leg press. It is used to overload the 
concentric action while assisting with concentric action. This helps into focusing in the eccentric phase, making it more um, an inter, uh, eccentric persistence training program. Um, in this test, they were looking to test a 1RM in leg press, leg flexion and extension, while evaluating symptoms with a, Wo a Womack scale, which is specific for arthritis, which I'll be going in detail after. The results showed that both the concentric and the eccentric persistence training group showed about 16 to 28% improvement compared to the control group. It was also seen that participants with the WOMAC um, pain reduction of greater than 30 um, showed greater strength gains than those compared with less than 30%, but not enough, there was not enough, um, it couldn't, it was too much of a statistical um, difference that it couldn't be put as a, as a specific conclusion. It was concluded that both resistance training types were effective in increasing leg muscle strength and contributing to the improvement in, um, in strength and symptoms. The degree of strength that was gained was associated with pain relief, not the resistance exercise training type. So they also concluded that the choice of exercise that, um, that the individual might want to choose um, can be dependent to the individual as long as the type of exercise, um, it helps to, to alleviate symptoms of osteoarthritis. The next study I'm gonna be discussing is the investigation of clinical effects of high and low resistance training for patients with knee osteoarthritis. It was a randomized controlled trial. It was eight weeks of supervised training. It consisted of 102 participants greater than the age of 50. It was three groups, a high resistance training group, low resistance training group, and a no exercise control group. Both legs were trained with a five minute interval between left and right knee, but for the initial intensity for the high resistance group, it was used 60% of their 1RM that was tested in their initial visit. For the low resistance group, it was 10% of their 1RM. Every two weeks, this 1RM was retested and increased by 5% compared to the first visit. They were looking to test the difference in knee pain, walking time, and knee muscle torque or force. It resulted that the muscle force of the knee extensors and flexors was greater in both groups compared to the no control, the no exercise control group. Um, both um, reduced pain and improved function of knee osteoarthritis. Furthermore, it also demonstrated that the differences of the high resistance training group were um, greater, but once again, the significant the differences weren't significant. So it's just concluded that um, that exercise in general was um, beneficial for knee osteoarthritis. Talking, going into more my study, my purpose was the study was to determine if a resistance exercise program reduces the symptoms of spine osteoarthritis compared to no resistance exercise group. As mentioned before, there is little to no research on OA of the spine. And OA is a prevalent muscular skeletal disease, and much of the literature is directed to whether the knee or the hip. But I'm interested in finding more information on what would be spinal range. I'm going to be mentioning my methods, starting with what would be the study design. It would be a 12-week resistance training program run by an exercise professional for patients who have been currently diagnosed with spinal OA and are currently experiencing symptoms. They're gonna be ranging from ages 60 to 75, and they have to be physically active individuals, meaning that they have to be involved in six or more months of moderate intensity exercise, two times a week for at least 30 minutes. And I'm gonna be dividing the study into two groups. Ideally, I'm gonna have about 20 to 30 subjects, 10 to 15 per group, and they will be randomly assigned to a resistance training group or a control group. The experimental group will participate in the exercise while the control group will just be um, moderating, monitoring food intake and provided by a dietary log that can be utilized for the study. To recruit my subjects, um, it's gonna be advertising local newspaper, but as we know, everything is more um, in the internet right now. So it's gonna be more on social media and flyers that are also gonna be posted online. And it's gonna be mainly on requests to local offices of chiropractic. Because of my interest in chiropractic and because I find that there could be more patients to look for in chiropractic offices. The inclusion criteria is that my, my subjects will have to be ranging from 
60 to 75 years of age. They're going to have to have pain on more on more than half the days of the month during during daily activities prior to the study. Meaning daily activities such as walking, standing upright, getting in and out of the car, going um, down and up the stairs. There's going to have radiographic evidence of the spine and um, in an MRI, and that they have been physically active for six months or more, again, three times a week for 30 minutes, moderate intensity. Exclusion criteria will include that they have a medical condition that precludes safe participation and exercise. This can be anywhere from a cardiorespiratory disease to renal disease, or also um, an intraarticular injection that we've received that might aid their symptoms, might help with symptoms that might impact um, the study's results. Um, I'm going to be going into what would be the materials and equipment involved in the study. There's going to be three weights, such as the dumbbells right below here, resistance band as well, exercise machinery, such as the leg press on the top left, an MRI machine to examine um, osteoarthritis, um, osteoarthritis in the spine, a bot pot to measure body composition, a hand grip dynamometer that will measure the hand grip strength, a dietary log that's going to be used to monitor their daily intake of foods and beverages, a health history questionnaire, and a part Q that are going to help establish if a participant is safe for exercise, and a woman's pain scale that's specific for arthritis that I will be mentioning specific in a few. Furthermore, my procedures. It's going to start with the first visit. Every patient is going to come in in separate individual time, at least two weeks before the study. They're going to be required to fill an informed consent that's going to be explaining the description, the purpose, the benefits, the risks, and the discomforts of the study. There's going to be a health history questionnaire and a part Q that's just going to be a series of questions to identify potential risks or presence of, or presence of cardiovascular disease so they can be excluded from the study. Anthropometric, anthropometric data, including height, weight, body fat percentage, that's going to be through the bot pod. Range of motion testing, um, there's going to be measured a sit and reach testing for flexing, a cobra stretch for extension, and a trunk rotation test for rotation. Um, a 5RM testing in human performance lab will be conducted to estimate their 1RM, which is going to be used for the study. The hand grip dynamometer, again, to measure their hand grip strength. The WOMEX scale, which is a Western Ontario and McMaster University's arthritis, arthritis index and the dietary log that, once again, will help monitor their food and um, beverages, beverages intake. Here's an example of what a Lumac skill is. Um, you would fill in, basically, your name to date, and there's going to be a set of instructions. It's going to range from zero, meaning no, no, no difficulty or no discomfort, to four, meaning extremely. This is mainly of daily activities to measure um, pain and performing daily activities, once again, daily activities such as rising from sitting, going in, getting in and out of the car, taking off socks, or even laying in bed. The dietary log, this would be an example dietary log that would be used for the study. Simple, this could measure um, the time, the food and the beverage they consumed, and the amount consumed. The 5RM testing will be performed by a fitness professional and will be conducting the following. It would be a fiber arm um, consisting of a leg press using a weight stack machine, which is on your top right, meaning that there's not going to be any free weight. It's also going to be um, just a switch of weights. It's going to be a bench press on a barbell. An example would be here. And this, this fiber arm, a predicted one RM, will be calculated to perform the exercises when the program comes. Um, it is specific to each individual, but once again, it will be 75% of that one around. For my first group, which is the exercise, the resistance exercise training group, it will be a 12-week um, facility-based program. The purpose of the study is to improve overall muscular fitness of the individual, meaning that the exercises that are going to be shown are to improve and strengthen muscle groups both in the upper and lower extremities of the body. They will participate in this 12-week facility-based program um, consisting of two classes per week with a light intensity warm-up geared towards the exercise that are going to be performed. And this, the purpose is, or to increase the intensity of the exercise, it will all be based on 
the maximal resistance that can be overcome in 12 reps. 12 reps specifically because uh, moderate intensity is measured basically from 6 to 12 repetitions. So if they can overcome 12 reps using proper form and comfortable rating in the 6 to 20 board scale, they're going to be increased in weight because they're going to be comfortable. Um, after the first six weeks, progressions will be performed um, manually. They're going to be into the exercise program. And they will also be in charge of using the dietary log to monitor and evaluate that food intake. Next is I'm going to be demonstrating a potential um, exercise training program. So exercises in this exercise training program are the box squat, dumbbell RDLs, another example are box step ups, and good morning. In my next slide, I'm going to be um, showing examples of what these exercises might look like. But once again, this program is intended to be a 12 week program, two times per week, and with a six week progression. Meaning that this column to the left, Tuesday and Thursday for six weeks is going to be the basic um, forms of these exercises, and the next following week, which is these two columns, is going to be a more progressed form of exercises. Um, for example, box squats. They would not be holding a barbell, it would be body weight, but it would be a starting position of a, a neutral standing up straight, sitting to the box, and standing up. For example, if an individual cannot perform that because it's too advanced into the OA or it's too painful, the individual will take charge, and instead of maybe standing up to sitting, the exercise professional can make a modification as to begin sitting down, and the performance is just standing up. Resistance band rows, um, med ball chest pass can be performed with a partner or against the wall, dumbbell RDLs, seated neutral grip dumbbell press, and leg press. Furthermore, progressions of these exercises include goblet squats, making it more complicated because it's free weight, there will be no box, and you have free weight holding it on your hands, which makes it a more full body um, exercise. Chest supported row, med ball slam, good morning, which perform um, for the uh, hamstring, standing double press, and box step ups. Again, if an exercise is too complicated, such as the good morning, weight might be removed, and you can perform this exercise without weight. But the exercise professional will take charge of, of that. My second group is the control group, the one that will not be performing any exercise. But they will be directed not to alter any of their usual um, physical activity, medication intake, if any, and their nutrition. They will be um, asked to maintain a dietary log for those 12 weeks that will be used to evaluate the food intake. This will be used at the end of the study to make sure that if there are any deviations or any differences between the two groups, we can refer back to um, different in maybe their food intake and the diet they consume. The second visit, which would be the post visit after those 12 weeks, um, anthropometric data will be taken again, which would include the height, weight, and the body fat again with using a BUDCON. The range of motion using the same tests, such as the sit and reach, the sit and reach testing for flexion, the cobra stretch for extension, and the trunk rotation test for rotation will be performed again. The 5RM will be performed. Um, again, to estimate and to see improvement, if any, um, in the evaluated or in the 1RM. The hand grip dynamometer will also be used to measure that hand grip strength, and the warming scale will be used to evaluate those symptoms compared to the initial visit pre-study to see if there was any improvement in, in the symptoms. This is a general tool chart of how my um, study will be taking place. There will be participant recruitment using um, flyers, social media, newspaper. There will be an interviewer screening to make sure the participant meets the inclusion or the exclusion criteria. If so, they're going to initiate that first visit. Will anthropometric and the pre-training testing will take a part. Um, next, all of our participants will be randomized into two groups, which will consist of the resistance training group or the control group. Ideally, once again, we're going to have about 20 to 30 subjects that can be split into 10 to 15 subjects each play. The resistance training group will undergo the 12-week training program and the dietary log, while the control group will only be doing the dietary log with no exercise involved. They will both come in for their second visit, which will include the post-training test, where all the measurements will be taken again to see improvements, if any, once again. The hypothesis of my study is that the resistance training group will show reduced back pain, increased range of motion, 
and increase muscular strength compared to the control group. For this study, appropriate statistical analyses will be employed and some foreseeable limitations. So we are trusting the subjects not to do extra exercise or changing their habits during the study, um, meaning that it's, if something happens, if someone takes changes their, um, their food intake, that might alter potential um, results. And furthermore, um, moderate intensity is classified between 60 and 80% of um, that one RM. And for this study, we are using a higher um, percentage of what is the regular moderate intensity. And prior um, studies have shown effectiveness of exercise in the range of 60 to 65. So potential limitation could be that we're using a higher level of intensity in the training program, which could potentially be a limitation. These are my references, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. training would you do for cervical arthritis? Um, like potential exercises? Okay, that's a great question actually. Um, I'm not completely informed into like cervical exercises, but I assume it would be more like upper extremity um, exercises, including more upper body, like upper body extremities. But I will leave that to the exercise professional, which will be in charge of um, making the program exercise. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Do you feel that using 30 participants in your study will give you enough data to make a conclusive result, or do you think you'll have to reconduct the study with more participants? Well, hopefully it is enough, um, enough participants to make like conclusive data. Um, but realistically, I can't aim for much higher um, participant or subjects recruitment, basically because it is a, it is a very, how can I say this? It isn't um, a very predominant disease that many people experience symptoms older, and maybe the recruitment process could be harder to, to find um, people with the disease. But I am confident that with 30 uh, individuals, I will be able to sustain enough information to analyze the data. Yes, I'll give you a suggestion, because um, I served on the board of directors for a senior center here in the area. That would be a place you could go recruit African seniors. Uh, they run exercise centers, they even have special classes. Might, they might be doing some kind of exercise, but they wouldn't vary it from what you're doing. Great, thank you. <laughs> I've got a question. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's had me in class, knows I always ask a question. This may seem random, but you need to know this in order to graduate. <laughs> what is the thick equation? Um, VO2 equals cardiac output times AVO2 difference. Great, congratulations. <laughs> Slide of your program to get yes. the program on. Yes. Yeah, that looks real familiar. Um, whoever designed that, you know, should probably get some credit for putting that thing together. Thank you, Dr. P. You're welcome. <laughs> um, now for my actual question. And take a moment, you know these. You talked about concentric and eccentric muscle length. What's your concept? Oh, was that your question? Two birds with one <laughs> what is a concentric muscle act? Um, uh, when the muscle is performing, um, when it's shortening, but it is acting, it is it is producing force while shortening. Beautiful. Eccentric. The same thing, but it's pr producing form while lengthening. Okay, last one. Isometric. It is pr producing force, but it's stable. It's not either lengthening or shortening. You guys know more than we do. <laughs> so I only have one question, can, because we have a wide range of our you know, participants and seniors here, can you just remind everyone
on the difference between a progressive and a regressive exercise? You did, you gave some great examples. So could you just kind of define the difference between a progression and a regression? Yes. So a progression would be the same exercise with a higher level of difficulty. So it's aiming on the same muscle groups, but if you are working harder to um, produce this exercise or to perform this exercise, while a regression would be taking the exercise back due to this person not being able to produce the, the exercise with proper form or with ability or with comfortable ability to do so. Thank you so much. Any last questions? All right, very well done. <laughs> So basically, what we're going to be discussing today, introduction, which is going to include my interest, why I, decided, why I chose this topic, why I decided to talk about this. Then I'm going to give you a basic um, introduction about vitamin D and why it's important, as well as talk about um, musculoskeletal injuries and the definition that we're going to use for the study and some different types of injuries. Then I'm going to go into my research question, my review of literature, which we're going to talk about two studies related to my topic. My purpose statement, and a purpose statement, my methods, I'm going to talk about the subject, the exclusion and inclusion criteria, I'm going to talk about the materials that I use, as well as the uh, procedures. Then we have my statistical analysis, my two hypotheses, potential limitations, and then my references. So to start off, why did I choose this topic? Why am I interested? Well, vitamin D is an essential nutrient that we all need, we all absorb in, in some way. Uh, I, I saw a study and it said that up to one billion people suffer from vitamin D deficiency. And that is some, something that is not talked about enough. And when it comes to the athletes, like, vitamin D is an essential nutrient because it, absor it absorbs calcium. And calcium is important for bone health. So if you're not absorbing all that calcium, uh, all that vitamin D, your bones are not gonna be strong enough, or not gonna be fully developed which is going to increase the risk of musculoskeletal uh, injuries. I also wanted uh, the topic of expand knowledge of vitamin D and how it influences your body and how it allows the body to, to perform in these uh, bodily functions, daily functions, and just to keep, uh, just basically keep functioning. I also am interested in the difference on vitamin D levels between uh, different college athletes in this study, particularly indoor and outdoor college athletes. And then I wanted to study the relationship between low vitamin D levels uh, and the risk of musculoskeletal injuries. So 
So, what is vitamin D? It's a fat soluble vitamin that is absorbed by the body. It can be absorbed in two different ways, which I'm going to talk about in this next right here. It can be absorbed through the skin, through UV rays from the sun, and it can also be absorbed through our diet. It can be divided into two, vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. The vitamin D2 is the one that we absorb through the, sun, the UV rays from the sun, and the vitamin D3 is the one that we absorb through diet and, and supplements. This uh, includes foods like fish, eggs, dairy, uh, dairy products, uh, cereal, and stuff like that, as well as supplements. Uh, supplements. So in this first uh, bullet point, it says it helps retain calcium and phosphorus levels in your body, which is essential for bone health as well. So if we take away, if we don't absorb that vitamin D, that would mean there would be a decrease in calcium levels, which ultimately what would cause is for uh, the thyroid uh, hormone to reabsorb calcium from the kidneys, and that will lead to the absorption of uh, uh, calcium levels from the uh, I need to read real quick. I'm sorry. Yeah, that would activate that would activate the osteoclast, which are, which are the cells that degrade bones and make us weak, and that would increase the uh, the risk of injury just because it makes our bones weaker and they're not getting fully developed. And then another uh, thing about vitamin D, our body transforms vitamin D to a chemical known. 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which I'm going to talk about later because this is how we measure vitamin D levels in our bodies. So we have a test that we run and we determine the levels in our body. Now we move on to musculoskeletal injuries. So for this study, a musculoskeletal injury is an injury that uh, affects muscles, bones, tendons, and ligaments. And there's injuries such as sprains, strains, stress fraction, and overuse. We know sprains are the injuries that affect um, our, our ligaments, uh, and the ligaments obviously is what connects bone to bone. Then we also have the strains, which are uh, over, uh, injuries that affect our tendons or a muscle or, or, or a torn muscle, which are tendons which is what connects um, bone to muscle. Then we have our stress fracture, which is what happens when the, uh, our, like a bone or a muscle can absorb the shock or a force that is being applied to, and just and it, and it just gets injured. And then overuse is uh, it's actually the word. Just the high demand that ha occurs over time of a body uh, a body part, and it's just like it can't handle like the the, the high demand. And then to, and at one point, it's just gonna give up and it's just gonna uh, injure. So musculoskeletal injuries for this study must be a non-contact injury. Why? Because then if there's not a, if, the, if it's a contact injury, then I can determine if the injury occurred because of a, because of the collision or the contact or because of vitamin D levels. So for, for this particular study, it will be a non-contact injury. And then athletes, for, for the athletes to be part of the study, they have to be able to receive treatment or a diagnosis from an, a doctor, an athletic trainer, or a physician. So my research question is, does low vitamin D levels increase the risk of musculoskeletal injuries among athletes who participate in indoor sports versus outdoor sports? And we're going to go to my review of Lynn, which talks about a little bit more about that. So the first study, it said, it examined the vitamin D levels from different sports, in the, in the study meaning indoor and outdoor sports, and it also took, measurement, uh, took vitamin D measurements of, during different times. So when I when I say time, it's during different like seasonal or environmental factors, like maybe and during the it took measurements during the winter and during the fall, which it has been like assimilated with during the winter low vitamin D levels because there's not much not a lot of sun exposure for athletes and the factors of being indoors they're getting less sun exposure. So uh, the the methods there was 555 participants. Ages 55 to 53 years old, and indoor and outdoor environmental and seasonal factors in different months were evaluated. So, meaning that they measured, they used the uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D test to measure vitamin D levels at the beginning and also at, at the end to uh, measure the vitamin D levels for indoor and outdoor athletes, as well 
when when they divided them, the athletes there were there were some athletes who were uh, took their measurements during the uh, fall and some measurements during the winter, so they can see the difference between that. And the results showed that out of the 555 athletes, 120 athletes had vitamin D deficiency, and they used a baseline, so less than 11 to 20 uh, nanograms per milliliter indicated vitamin D deficiency. Anything uh, uh, between that is normal, and anything above that is um, uh, high, vitamin D, high, high vitamin D levels. And then vitamin D levels were not significantly different from outdoor athletes, meaning outdoor athletes did not have like, any, any higher levels of vitamin D than indoor athletes. But vitamin D measurements during the winter were significantly lower, meaning that athletes during the winter time didn't have higher vitamin D levels because of what I said, sun exposure, they're not getting that same, the same. So I they came to a conclusion that gender and indoor outdoor sports athletes had no significant vitamin D level, but during the winter season, it showed a negative effect on those um, vitamin D levels on athletes. Now we move on to my second study. Uh, this study uh, assessed whether vitamin D supplementation is associated with the reduced risk of uh, muscular uh, stress fractures. But then we also have, they examined the uh, differences in vitamin D levels between indoor and outdoor athletes. So this is more of what I, uh, I wanted to uh, study and know about. So it included a uh, 802 NCAA athletes. And the athletes uh, with vitamin D levels, the baseline here was Less than 40 nanograms per milliliter were considered deficient, and over that were considered uh, normal or high. So they just had those two, uh, that, that, that single number. So if the athlete had less than 40, they were given supplementation either by, like, it could be like a multivitamin, they, they were put on a diet, or, or stuff like that, that they would raise their vitamin D levels through the study. And then, they assess stress factors among individuals that maintain or improve vitamin D levels. So if the, if the, if the vitamin D levels were high, then they would just uh, manage if the athlete suffered any, any injury, any stress fracture. But in, and if the athlete started with a low level of vitamin D and it improved it as well, they examined all of that. And again, like I said, the baseline is 40 nanograms per milliliter if it's higher than that. And they also examined the difference in average baseline levels between uh, sport types, so indoor and outdoor. So they evaluated the uh, vitamin D levels between indoor and outdoor athletes as well. So the results show that stress fractures were 12% higher for individuals who have low vitamin D level. So like I said, minus 40 nanograms per milliliter. And for both men and women, vitamin D levels were higher when for athletes who participated in outdoor sports, meaning indoor sports, had uh, less uh, vitamin D levels. Uh, and then the conclusion is the correct environment D levels reduces the risk of musculoskeletal injury, and indoor athletes may be at greater risk of vitamin D deficiency. Therefore, greater risk of get, uh, getting injured or just basically musculoskeletal injuries or stress fractures. So my further statement. So this study is conducted to compare vitamin D levels between indoor uh, college athletes versus outdoor college athletes and determine the risk of musculoskeletal injuries between them. And for this, my methods want to use my subjects. We have my subjects, this 100 participants, both men, men and women. And I chose, um, for the indoor athletes, I chose uh, basketball, and the outdoor athletes, I chose uh, soccer. The reason because of this is because I feel like they have similar athletic capabilities, like they have same movements, like. Uh, they play like different uh, like times and all of that. So things such as acceleration, um, rotating, and then stopping quick and then turning around and stuff like that. They they do similar things. So I feel like it will be easier for for the study to like have uh, athletes who have similar things like that. So because injuries could be really similar as well. So and then the ages of uh, it will be 18 to 23 years of age, that's the range, normal range for college athletes. And then athletes want to be part of a college sports team. And for this, we recruit athletes, but we ask coaches for permission first to make sure that coaches were okay with the athlete being a part of the study. 
and they weren't they didn't have any trouble with it. Uh, during that, and then during that first visit, uh, Alphys would report to a lab where all the instructions and procedures would be explained, and then they would be handed an informed consent and a part Q what they would read, and we will explain all the procedures and all the instructions for the study that they will have to like know prior to enrolling and accepting and participating. Uh, the inclusion criteria for this uh, study is any athlete who has to participate in a college sports for more than four months. Either if you're if you're a freshman coming in and you and you do not like participate in college sport, you're not allowed to. If you've been out for any reason and you have participated in a sport uh, as well, you you would not be part of the study. And then okay, athletes who with recent musculoskeletal injuries, two to six months, depending on severity. When I say two to six months. It, again, just depends on severity. Like we want the athlete to be fully recovered. Like it's like, yeah, like I don't want to take an athlete in the middle of re recovery and just okay, we're gonna, we're gonna throw you into the study and then I don't know if you fully recover, but if you get injured again, then how am I gonna be able to determine? Oh yeah, the the injury is because of vitamin D levels. No, because like, again, I want a fully recovered athlete to be part of the study. And then athlete that got injured on non-sport either an injury, non-sport meaning. They were, they were going down the stairs and they fell, or they were in a car crash, or something like that. Like, I want to be more sport uh, uh, during uh, comp competition, either practice or, or playing. Or playing. Same thing, it has to be a uh, non, uh, uh, non contact injury as well. And then, if the participant suffers from any chronic disease that inhibits vitamin D absorption, uh, so the athletes. Like we're gonna send like low levels of vitamin D, and then we're gonna run some external different tests to see if the athlete could be part of the study. And then I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more during when I talk about the vitamin D test that we're gonna run. And then if the participant is part of both an indoor and outdoor sports team, uh, I don't think this will go well with the study just because like then athlete could have higher levels of vitamin D and so be an indoor, indoor uh, sport uh, athlete. Like again, like I want it to be neutral. Like we're not gonna be able to measure how much time the athlete spends inside or spends outside, but we want it to like have like like that baseline. So the athlete cannot be part of the uh, sport, uh, sport, sport team. So we have the part Q that we're gonna hand to the to the subjects, which is a health screening a questionnaire that includes. Questions about uh, health history, physical activity, and family history, and it's just going to have answer some questions about cardiovascular diseases and all of that. And then it will help us to identify individuals who might need clearance from a doctor prior to enrolling in the study and being part of it. So these are my three materials. We have the 25 hydroxy of vitamin D test. We have a lot to keep track of vitamin D measurements, and then we have an injury lab, which it would be used to report injuries that happen. Uh, throughout the season or at the end of the season. So let's go with the 25 hydroxy vitamin D test. So it is a test performed by a trained professional. Uh, we're going uh, to need a blood sample. Uh, and then it measures how much vitamin D is, uh, is in an individual's body. So, like I said earlier, that um, vitamin D is going to be transformed to uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is also known as cal. Calciferol as well, as well or calcium, my bad. No, it's calcium. And then it's the most accurate way to measure vitamin D. Uh, I said it earlier, but it is measured in nanograms per, uh, per milliliter, so you're gonna see this a lot. And then the experts recommend a level of 20 to 50 nanograms per milliliter to be considered as normal vitamin D level. Anything above that, it is, uh, fifth, uh, it is uh, high vitamin D. Anything under that is considered low vitamin D levels. So for my study, I decided to use this baseline as well, which I'm gonna show you uh, early on, uh, later on. Here we have the vitamin D log, which we're gonna, is gonna help us track uh, your name, your, uh, your name, your height, your weight, gender, the sport, if it's indoor or outdoor, and then we're gonna take your first vitamin D levels measurement during that first visit, and then during the second visit, we're gonna take that second vitamin D level measurement. So the second visit could vary, it could be either at the end of the season, and then, because the, the first vitamin D measurement is going to be at the beginning of the season before the, uh, the like it starts. 
and then the second one is either be out when the season's over or if the athlete sustained an injury in season, the athlete has 24 to 48 hours to report to us and we can take those uh, vitamin D uh, measurements. And then we, we then have the injury log, which is going to go together with the, with the other uh, log, which is name, gender, sport type, uh, or type of injury, the day of the injury, and then the vitamin D level post injury. So again, it's going to 24 or 48 hours to report, and then we're going to take those vitamin D level measurements and compare them to the initial vitamin D measurements. My procedures. So during that first visit, first visit and from consent for Q, like I said earlier, the office will come, the subject will come in and we'll explain everything and all the instructions. And then a baseline for vitamin D levels will be determined for both men and women, will be determined by the researchers, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. We have that baseline left. Then the vitamin D levels will be measured at the beginning of their season and will be divided into outdoor and indoor sports athletes. So, again, like I said earlier, if your season is about to begin, we're taking that uh, vitamin D levels measurement, that first visit, and then once the season's over, we'll begin, we'll, we'll take the next one. And then, as I said here, and then vitamin D levels will be measured by a trained professional who will come in and perform the 25 hydroxy vitamin D test, as I mentioned earlier. So, here's the baseline uh, vitamin D levels baseline that I mentioned earlier. So deficient will be less than 12 nanograms per uh, milliliter. A normal range of vitamin D will be 20 to 50 nanograms per milliliter, and high vitamin D levels is 50 nanograms per milliliter. So during that second visit, uh, it will be at the end of the season. Uh, once your season is done, we'll take that measurement. Like after the season is over, it could be 24, 48 hours after that first injury. You guys can uh, the subjects come back, and we'll take that measurement. And then uh, the results will be compared to the initial vitamin D levels, uh, to that first um, measurement, and then we'll decide if, and, and then we'll see like if this after sustain any injuries throughout the throughout the season, and see if we can relate them to the vitamin D levels. And then all vitamin D levels will be analyzed and determine the difference uh, of vitamin D levels between indoor and outdoor. So we we'll can we compare them and see who had the higher vitamin D levels throughout the season lowest one. And like I said, if the athlete sustain a musculoskeletal injury during the season, vitamin D levels will be measured right after injury, 24 to 48 hours they have, they can, they have to report to us. And measurement will help determine if vitamin D was related to the injury or not. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the injury has to be a non-contact injury and it should be sport related. Statistical analysis will be used when analyzing the data for the study. And my two hypotheses were indoor athletes were exhibiting lower levels of vitamin D than compared to um, outdoor athletes. And then there will be an increased frequency in musculoskeletal injuries on indoor athletes when compared to outdoor athletes. And some potential limitations would be injuries sustained may not be due to vitamin D levels. Like there's, yeah, we, we, what happens if an athlete sustains an injury that has high vitamin D levels, then we can relate them to that. It's just a freak accident that just happened, so we cannot relate those injuries to their vitamin D levels. And then we also have indoor athletes that participate in outdoor activities and are exposed to sunlight. Again, like we're not gonna prevent or say, oh no, you can't go outside, you can spend time with, like, in the sun or be exposed to the sun. Like it's just, again, it's just things that happen. So it might be an indoor athlete, but it might have high levels of vitamin D. It's just something that we can't control. And then raising skin color, we have no control, but it can influence vitamin D synthesis through their pigmentation and how they're um, absorbed vitamin D. Um, there are my references. Thank you. Any, any questions? <laughs> So, oh, it's just so hard because all of a sudden. 
things that I looked into, the average base time of just having like either 40, like 20 to 50 was like the base time, which is for normal. Anything above that that they consider as high run and mid level. I saw a little bit about the IUs, but I didn't know like what the base time was for IUs. So I think it would be a little bit different. But I mean, you can definitely check that out. And Yep. Is there a relationship between skin color and does one absorb vitamin D better or less than the other? Yeah, so like um, darker skin, like they tend to like have like different, because of their pigmentation actually, they tend to have like, not trouble, like they tend to absorb vitamin D by glass just because of like their skin color. So, yeah. Do you think there's merit to prescription of vitamin D? to athletes who are more likely to yeah. experience overuse yeah, injuries? Yeah, I feel like one of the studies I also looked into to the athletes that had low vitamin D levels, they prescribe like more like vitamin D supplementation, you know, they change their diet, the whole thing. But lower vitamin D levels can increase the risk of like you, so definitely take care of Yeah. Have you thought about how geography might play into vitamin D? Yeah. Yeah. Away. yeah. So uh, I actually have talked about it with professors one time, and I feel like people who have like cold places where the sun is not there all the time are gonna feel like they're gonna have like lower vitamin D levels. So what I would recommend is just take some kind of supplementation or like, change your diets would would help increase that vitamin D level. <laughs> Did I not ask the next question? Um, what are the other fat soluble vitamins? What's that? Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, correct? Yeah. What are the other fat soluble vitamins? And then I have one, okay, I guess I have two more. Okay. Are you controlling for uh, dietary vitamin D, like how much vitamin D that they're consuming? Uh, I mean, there's no control. Like, we're not going to change an athlete's diet just because, like. Are you going to monitor it, though, so you have an idea of how much yeah, they're, they're consuming? Yeah, okay. I'll have to monitor that and just, like, and again, like, if an injured athlete has low levels, and then they just take the supplementation, I feel like we'd have to monitor that and take that into account where, in deciding it. Yeah, but you can't, I mean, because your, your, your basic question is, does being outside more affect vitamin D levels? Which is good. Yeah, it would be non-contact must be over there. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Yep. Why are there, you mentioned that you're going to have male and female subjects. And I don't know if you know this answer, so if you don't know the answer, Menstrual cycle does all sorts of weird things. That's coming from somebody that's never had it. <laughs> does vitamin D absorption change? It does, does it? Yeah. Well, it doesn't change, but like females tend to have lower vitamin D levels just because like like you saw the menstrual cycle and like how different it is. So yeah, they, they, I feel like I don't I don't really know if it's like less of more trouble absorbing vitamin D. I have to like look more into that, but I know that vitamin D levels tend to be lower on females. You can look at, I was looking into a buddy of potassium. I can't find any connection to it, so that's why I asked. Oh, yeah. Definitely look into it. Yes. All right, my one question is going to go based off of the location. So because obviously geographic location matters, right, are you going to have, I don't remember if you said this or not, so correct me if I'm wrong, would you have the all of your subjects be from the same geographic location? I did not say that, but I think it would be like a good maybe. Like I, I, again, I'm recruiting athletes who are in the same like college. Like it's not okay. gonna be. So then yes. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so I didn't mention that, but I feel like. So can you tell people why that's important? So what if we had an indoor athlete from Florida that you did indoor basketball player from Florida, but then your outdoor athletes from New England? Could that still 
the cortisol levels will be tested through saliva and saliva swabs, and if cortisol levels are present, then anxiety typically goes along. So the first article we will be doing is uh, Gender Differences with Anxiety, Cookies, Confidence, and Grit in Collegiate Track and Field Throwers. So the purpose of this study was to examine any gender differences regarding self-perceived grit and need performance in males and female collegiate track and throwers. So for this study, they examined five male athletes and four female athletes. And the study took place over a six week period, examining the athletes throughout the study. But the way they were able to collect data was asking them five questions after each competition and taking them into a secluded room and asking how they felt overall about their sports performance. This study is very non-traditional and data wasn't completely clear and didn't have a stated outcome, but they were able to measure that females expressed that external factors played a major role into influencing their anxiety levels during competition, as well as they were able to determine differences of how male and female throwers dealt with anxiety, as well as male participants showing a lower score of anxiety than females. The next article we will be reviewing is the impact of competitive trait anxiety on collegiate power within performance. And the purpose of this uh, article was to determine the relationship between competitive trait anxiety measures and power lifting performance. This was evaluated through a SCAT, the Sports Competitive Anxiety Test, which is a 15 questionnaire that is self-evaluating that the participants would fill out on their own with no time limit before competition. And they would be asked questions they would be asked to answer questions on a scale of <coughs> one to five, five being all the time, one being none of the time, and rating different situations that may have tr triggered anxiety. They were able to find that women's athletes demonstrated higher SCAT scores than men when comparing genders. It was also found that the total SCAT scores were negatively correlated to the athlete's percentage of best total achieved competition, and that was in relation to the events the athletes were participating in, squat, bench press, and deadlift. And the only positive correlation for the event was the squat, and bench press and deadlift had a negative correlation with the SCAT scores. And the last article we will be reviewing are cortisol and anxiety responses in female collegiate golfers during qualifying and competition play. And the purpose of this article was to investigate competition anxiety and cortisol responses, as well as their relationship with performance during two types of non-stimulated competitive golf rounds in female collegiate athletes. They were able to identify cortisol levels through a saliva swab that was taken 15 minutes prior to the golf golfer's starting competition, as well as at holes 1, 6, 12, and 18. Um, there were seven females tested in this study, and they were able to determine that cortisol levels were at their highest pre-competition, and as rounds went, progressed during the match, cortisol levels started to decrease, meaning their anxiety started to decrease throughout competition. Um, they were also, also used a sports anxiety scale, which is different from the SCAT. Um, sports anxiety scale is a multi-dimensional scale that we will talk about later. Uh, more in depth later, but they were able to determine through the scale scores that there were higher levels of anxiety on qualifying day, although it was not statistically significant. Next is my purpose statement for the study. So the purpose of this research proposal is to identify a correlation in female collegiate lacrosse players, lacrosse teams, and sports anxiety and sports performance. So next we will <laughs> Next, we will be going into methods. Um, this is going to be everything that will be covered um, in when carrying out the study. So it will be including study design, participants, procedures, material, and statistical analyses. So first up is the study design. Um, so this will be our correlational study due to it looking into the relationship between female lacrosse teams and performance anxiety in a preseason scrimmage versus an in-season game. The study will take place during a no normal school year and during a full lacrosse preseason and in-season schedule. 
participants will be part of the NCAA lacrosse team, and all games will be played on home field for the team that will be examined, and only one team will be collecting data from one time sharing data. Um, just meaning that one team will only be examined for anxiety versus not the other team. So the dependent variables in the study, the first one is going to be the score differential, which is defined as the measure of performance of a round in a relation to the relative difficulty of the <coughs> to play. In this case, the amount of goals scored by one team compared to how many goals scored by the other team. And the independent variables will be the anxiety levels how to, and how they're measured, as well as the preseason scrimmage versus the in-season competition game. The Anxiety scores, anxiety levels will be measured through the sports anxiety scale, blood pressure, heart rate, as well as the cortisol swab. And preseason scrimmage and in season competition games will be the dependent variable, independent variable, due to it not changing because you're unable to reverse the order to have a competition before the preseason games just because of how the season plays out. Um, participants for the study, so requirements to participate in the study is obviously being a female and a part of the collegiate women's lacrosse team at that university, as well as between the ages 18 and 24. And I will advertise for this through recruitment in posters, emails, as well as reaching out to coaches at universities. Next will be the procedures, and this will be the step-by-step -step process I will take during the study and carry out to get the most accurate results, as well as keeping all participants safe during the study. Um, so the first stage of procedures is being collecting baseline data. So the first time participants come in, they will be asked to fill out a informed consent as well as a part two to make sure they understand what the study is for, what they will be doing. This, oh, sorry, <laughs> will be doing during the study as well if there's any health history that should not include them in the study. And from there, they will also have baseline data taken, such as blood pressure, heart rate and um, a saliva swab to test cortisol levels at baseline without any anxiety before competition. Um, and then when they when we meet with them the second time, it will be for the preseason scrimmage, which we will explain the sports anxiety scale questionnaire, <coughs> and that will be taken one hour prior to competing in a game, as well as setting up polar heart rate monitors that will connect to them, that will be on them the whole time, play as well as taking blood pressure um, and the saliva swab will be taken 15 minutes prior to the game. Um, participants that will be taking the saliva swab will be instructed not to eat or drink anything 15 minutes prior to competition for the most accurate results. And then the next part of the study will go into the in-season competition which have very similar steps participants will be advised to take the questionnaire one hour prior to competition, as well as being set up with heart rate monitors, taking blood pressure, and taking the saliva swab 15 minutes prior to competition. Once all data is collected, we'll be able to break down the sports anxiety scale into different scores for each participant, and then come to an end mean goal for the team to have a one mean score, which will compare from one game to the next. Um, once that score is broken down, we'll, we'll be able to use the SAS-2, which is the multi-dimensional scale that breaks down each question into a different amount of points that will determine the mean score and identify different anxiety triggers, as well as compare cortisol levels from the first game to the second game to see if anxiety was actually present or if it was just them, how they felt on that day filling out the questionnaire. Um, next will be the materials that will be used in the study. So first is the polar heart rate monitor. Next will be a blood pressure cuff, a cortisol ELSA kit, a patient health questionnaire, and a sports anxiety scale. So the polar heart rate monitor will be worn during competition, before and during competition. And this is the most, this provides the best accuracy for heart rate to be tracked during exercise as well as it is most comfortable for athletes to wear. Um, blood pressure cuff will be taken before and we'll have a professional who has practiced and certified in taking blood pressure for each participant to go through, as well as the cortisol ELSA kit. This is the most common kit used in studies to test cortisol levels and it is the most accurate. 
Um, and this will be able to confirm if anxiety is present um, in that participant. And a patient health questionnaire will also be administered because sometimes it is able to diagnose early onset of anxiety or depression and can rule out if there's any indicators for that participant not to be included in that study. Um, next will be the sports anxiety scale. So this is really the main part that will make up this study when scaling anxiety. You can do it all being multidimensional measurement of cognitive and somatic trait anxiety in sports performance. And it consists of 15 questions. And this is a similar scale. This is not the exact scale that would be used. The good thing about the SAS2 is you are able to change some of the questions so it is sports specific as well as gender specific. Um, and this is just kind of an outline of what it be, scaling certain questions, one to five, one not doing at all, and five all the time. Um, and then from there, this is also how the scale is broken down into different parts to come up for a mean score for each participant and then lead to a team mean score. Um, so see broken down on the side here are numbers all the way here. And each of those count as points. So depending on what number that participant rates that kind of question will determine how high of a score they will get in that. Um, in the sports anxiety scale test. Um, and they're broken down into different categories of um, concentration, disruption, somatic anxiety, and worry. And depending on the score, as seen in the last column here, it was for college age students. Um, if they have a score of 3.61 in the number of parentheses, if it is 3.61 or higher, they have stated that they have high anxiety in their sports anxiety scale. Um, if it is anything lower than that, they are on the lower end of any anxiety disturbances. Um, and it's to find the mean score for each participant to then find the standard deviation for the team. You would add up each score in the parentheses, not the total score, but each score in the parentheses to find your total score. And then another reason to use the sports anxiety scale, it is one of the most accurate and validated sports anxiety scales currently out there. Um, and it is measured is used to measure competitive anxiety as a trait opposed to an anxiety state. Thus, anxiety measured by the SAS2 scale expresses a relative constant and stable tendency to experience anxiety in situations before and during comp athletic competitions. And appropriate statistical analyses will be measured and employed in this study. Next is my hypothesis, and I have two. So the first one is a hypothesis that female athletes will experience higher levels of competition anxiety during an in-season competition game compared to a preseason scrimmage, as well as the score differential will be higher in the preseason scrimmage compared to the in-season competition game. And next, a potential limitation for the study. So unfortunately, there are kind of a lot of potential limitations for this study. Just two, because there are a lot of outside and external factors that can uh, play effects into this. So luckily, we will try to eliminate as many as possible, such as keeping the games both at home, um, which does provide a potential limitation because there are less fans at an in-season game versus a preseason game, which is an external factor, which can more fans typically increase a uh, participant's anxiety level. Um, so we'll definitely be examining and looking into that as well as we're not able to measure the competition versus the preseason game as stated earlier just because of how the season carries out as well as not being able to identify specific position anxiety versus a defender who has anxiety versus an attacker who has defender. We won't be able to compare the two, hence them being a team, a whole team score of anxiety. Another potential limitation is self-evaluating. The questionnaires are filled out by the participants and is how they are feeling in that moment. Um, the cortisol levels are likely to be more accurate due to, the, due to them taking 15 minutes prior to competition versus the questionnaires being taken an hour before competition. So they might not have the onset of anxiety that hour before competition versus the 15 minutes before, as well as personal lives will be a potential limitation due to these being student athletes, they do have a lot going on in their lives and they are dealing with many things such as schoolwork, social life, and anything happening in their family lives. 
using my resources. That's what you do. Thank you. that there are differences in anxiety rates between males and females. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that you showed us uh, in terms of like how we evaluate anxiety, all relevant and all valid. Do you think that there's any possibility that women are more comfortable expressing those feelings even in sort of a survey form, than men 
And two, why do you think that is? I do agree with that statement. Um, I do think females are more comfortable openly talking about anxiety um, and seeking help if that is like what they are looking for to decrease their anxiety levels compared to males where it can be a sensitive topic because it's not widely talked about. Um, so it can be an uncomfortable and very vulnerable situation for a male to put themselves in if they want to come out about it because some people do discriminate and look down upon that and see it as a weakness, which no one wants to be seen weak. So I definitely do think that does play a role when reporting anxiety. Um, but adding to that, in one of the studies, they also stated that females experience anxiety differently through external factors. And some of those external factors included drama on the team. And I don't think males experience that type of drama on teams due to being more individually. But it, one of the main, one of the responses from the females in the studies reported that her teammate was having an episode, and that affected and increased her anxiety levels and affected her performance that day. So I do think that also could play a role. Part of toddlers having an episode. That's pretty scary. <laughs> All right, sticking. This will be a fast question. Sticking with the theme of the thick equation. So the other component besides cardiac output was um, arterial venous oxygen difference, right? So what does ADOC difference? Shedding light upon this idea 
of athletic identity and being able to have an opportunity to educate you guys and um, talk about it. So according to NCAA, there is 460,000 students amongst 24 different sports roughly each year. 2% actually have the opportunity or go and play at the professional level. So meaning that 98% of those athletes retire right after college, which is why I spoke, chose athletes for my topic, because not only do they have a stronger athletic identity, but there is a wide range of many athletes that have to go through this process. So for my review of literature, I have three common themes that we're just gonna be going over today. Um, just giving out some information, background information, and what the uh, topics have found. So it's athletic identity, transition out of sport experience, and career based formation. And they all correlate with each other, and um, I'll just keep on going through it because I don't want to jump ahead. <laughs> so athletic identity is the degree in which an individual identifies with an able. And it's actually a powerful motivator that can influence an individual, um, the way they feel, the way they think, and even the way they act. And there's two common categories I found that this research uh, article stated that it can strengthen an athlete's role, which is internal motivation and external motivation. Internal motivation means like your motivation to accomplish your goals within you, meaning that you have that genuine passion for that sport. You want to do well. You want to um, play well. And then you have, that ex you have that external motivation where you attain your goals comes from a source outside of yourself. So whether if you want to get more play playing time for your coach or some athletes who even want to go and move on to the play at the professional level. And or just even your peers, your family, wanting to do good for them as well. And then we have this construction of athletic identity. How, how does an athlete um, able to, how do you find out like your athletic identity is stronger? How do you construct that? And the role of an athlete develops as you get older, but there is still that part of you when you know, you're running around playing t-ball and you're pig-piling in the middle of uh, the game and just having fun. And then as you get older, you, it increases and you become more serious about that sport. You find that passion, you um, have that, yeah, you find that passion and you just, um, and you wanna get more serious, whether if you wanna play college, you um, wanna succeed in that sport. And then um, a huge factor also plays a role where your peers, your family, your coaches, teammates, environment, they all play a huge role, especially when it's positively reinforced as well um, when you're getting like praised by coaches or just having that experience as an athlete plays a, a big role on um, strengthening the athlete because it's the idea of it is positive for an individual and then there's a direct connection between time commitment meaning that the more an athlete spends time with that sport the degree of an athletic identity increases so college sports, everybody in here, or a lot of you guys in here, the schedules are lit, you got your lifts, you got practices, you have um, your video or um, any meetings or anything like that. So it's a high demand um, environment where you're constantly uh, putting yourself in positions where that is just your lifestyle. And the stronger an athlete's identity, athletic identity, the more difficult for the transition out of that sport. And I'll be going into my next um, research article uh, about transitional sport, which uh, will continue into that. So transition is a process from the beginning of an athletic environment through post-athletic participation. And retirement and transition pose a challenge for those who have constructed strong athletic identity. And there is a tendency in athletes that ignore or postpone the consideration of the future. I, for example, I mean, I'm a senior right now, and I have not thought about my career until maybe a couple months ago. 
because I know I'm, I'm an athlete and you know I use that as an excuse or as an out to not think about it because it would always terrify me so <laughs> and and that's okay it's something that I'm dealing with right now but it is I can relate to that and then athletes who fail in, uh, to invest in multiple activity, activities or roles may cling to their sports career and find little satisfac satisfaction or ego gratification um, in other domains. So I found this really interesting because um, if you took, uh, if you think about it, when an athlete is usually getting praised by that environment, being in college and um, being in a very successful athletic career, and then you transition into a career and you are the new guy. No one knows who you are. And um, it's hard for them to find that <coughs> fulfillment or that gratification on from the transition um, to their career. And retirement can lead to situations like feeling of grief, behavior disengagement, denial and venting. Um, denial and venting and disengagement would be um, like coping strategies for a lot of athletes and um, feeling grief would be uh, just facing new world challenges I mean it's not easy facing going into a new world and it's especially at a young age you're just trying to figure it out and um, but and I also just want to make a note of this that yes I'm talking about more about the psychological discrepancies but or in the variables but there are, um, in some cases, that can involve positive outcomes and um, new opportunities and professional growth as well. So uh, for this study, there was um, 15 former basketball and football players um, that were interviewed, open to the question, just being able to express how they felt um, through their transition process of uh, not being an athlete anymore. And major findings was that feeling loss, sadness, lack of motivation, and a little and a side note is that they, these athletes did not seek help or get clinically diagnosed. And sorry, and for the interview responses for um, these athletes. One stated that a lot of depression and emptiness. And then another one stated that I got hurt and my dream was dashed in a split second and it ended up in depression for me. Another one stated that feeling like you're the only one going through it, talking about his anxiety, and he also felt there was a lost structure. I mean, I can relate to this too because I sort of need that fire underneath my butt to get things done. I procrastinate. And so having that structure really helped me. And I think that that's a really valid point. Um, go being an athlete and having little time to get your schoolwork done. And then um, you have to you know, really try not to procrastinate. <laughs> but it is, it is difficult. And so I just, um, for this discussion, um, for this, Study, it's however the investigation factors that contribute to post retirement or depression and anxiety, even though they were stated in the interviews, um, it still has been limited because they did not um, test for specifically for depression or anxiety. And now we're going into my third article, which is injury based termination. And um, career termination has received an increased tension within um, psychological research and the importance of this consideration amongst athletes reasons for termination and so example like an involuntary or unplanned career termination can disrupt an athlete's well-being so this study um, was the process of adjustment in former athletes regarding a career-ending injury and there was um, seven division one and division two athletes who um, were categorized as normative, which occur um, when an athlete's transition to leave the sport following like graduation.
graduation, you're basically losing up all your eligibility, years of eligibility when you're graduating. Um, and then you have the non-normative athletes that um, they have an unexpected um, discrepancy to their athletic career, such as suffering a career-ending injury. And career-ending injuries um, potentially can lead to emotions like identity loss, loneliness, anxiety, fear, loss of confidence, and depression. Not only are you dealing with um, not being able to play the sport that you love, but you're also dealing with having to get better in being in the state of being injured as well. So, and then for this study, there was uh, five different themes that I'll just be going over. Um, and it was the consequences of the injury, social support, athletic identity, nature of injury, and pre-retirement pre planning. So for the major findings um, on the consequence of the injury, um, a lot of the athletes stated that it was difficult for them to accept. And um, so for the social support, two participants said they did not have support, but um, they're, most of them were supported by their family. Uh, and five, and for athletic identity, five out, of se five out of the seven related the scale of having a high athletic identity during um, career. Nature of injury, seriousness of career um, ending, or some were even uh, life-threatening, so they mentioned that they were lucky to even be alive. Um, and then pre-retirement pre planning, they did most, everyone said that they did not think about their future after the injury. And it stated that normative athletes experience more engaging towards career compared to non-normative. So for my purpose statement, I, um, for the design, I, um, it was, the purpose of this study was designed to investigate the psychological adjustment between retired college athletes in terms of normative and non-normative athletes. Like I was saying before, um, normative being able to go on, graduate, non-normative, any discrepancies of um, their athletes. For my methods, I wanted to uh, do 10 different NCAA um, institutions in the Western Mass area. Um, and I'm gonna be using an athletic identity measurement uh, scale, which is a subdivision between three different groups, social identity, exclusivity, and negative accessibility. I'll be going over those later. And um, I did a four question interview, just giving those athletes to have that opportunity <coughs> to express how they their experience and um, an opportunity as well. And for my independent variable, it would be the retirement reason of how it, like determining whether it was because they used up all the years of eligibility or if it was the, um, uh, if there was any career ending injury as well. And then dependent variable would be the adjustment. So for my procedure, um, we subject recruitment through email, contacting like athletic administration, and then um, the athletic identity measurement scale is going to be an online survey as well that's going to be uh, put in as an email where the athletes will be able to uh, just fill it out, and then um, a either be the conference room for those in-person interviews um, towards the second. So for my participant recruitment, I, I would go to local college teams around the Western Mass area and just going up to uh, the coaches, asking for permission and getting contact, um, uh, the athletes' contact information and so on um, to email them. And once that's, uh, when that happens, I would contact the athletes by emailing them with the online survey and uh, see if they had to end their career early. And then I would collect the data, dividing them into two subgroups, normative and non-normative, and also how high their athletic identity or how low their athletic identity measurement scale is. So 
for the inclusion criteria, it would be athletes who have participated in college sports and athletes who have graduated three to six post-graduation. The reason why I chose three months to six months after post-graduation, that way it gives the athletes um, a time where they're out of school. I did a re there is a research article that um, did just athletes um, still in school, but it was like fall athletes. So they were still in that environment where in college, and you, and you don't, I feel like you still have those similar resources. You have those peers, you have professors, and you have um, your friends. So I think that three to six months post-graduation would be more, um, a better result. Uh, so, and then I would did and then normative and non-normative athletes, obviously. And then for exclusion criteria, um, being currently involved in your sport, such as coaching or being in an intramural league, and then athletes who uh, have not played in high school, I think the reason why I chose this is because I'm um, athletes who haven't played in high school. I mean, usually you would think that like athletes in high school play that also play in college. But um, just to have that stated um, for that athletic um, identity measurement, so being more higher. And so these are my interview questions. I will have a sports psychologist um, have do, doing the interviews, going through that process. And so the first question would be, what was your experience from the transition to athlete to non-athlete? To what extent do you feel you focus on your non-athletic identity while participating in your sport? Um, as you mentioned, out of the demands of being an athlete, you may have suddenly found yourself with more free time. How did you do? How did you deal with that adjustment? And lastly, what was your experience in losing your athletic identity when you gave up that sport? These questions would just be good questions, just to um, give them an opportunity to be able to express instead of having like um, yes or no questions, just being able to give them like a more in-depth answer. And then for my athletic, so what an athletic identity measurement scale, it's um, divided up into three subgroups and participants choose from strongly agree, as in four, agree, three, disagree to, and uh, strongly disagree. And so it's a validated tool used to measure athletic identity, and because it becomes one of the most frequently used scales to measure athletic identity, and it's a 10-item scale which results from a unidimensional measurement of athletic identity and uh, more reversed in the initial testing for validity and reliability. And so these are, I have them on the next slide as well. So these are the four, um, some questions that the online server, I would be emailing my athletes for them to fill out, um, which is, I consider myself an athlete. I have many goals related to sport. Most of my friends are athletes. And that is actually um, under the categorization of social exclusivity. And then sport is the most important part of my life. I spend more time thinking about sport than anyone, than anyone else. I need to participate in sport to feel good about myself. Other people see me mainly as an athlete, and that would be under the categorization of exclusivity. And then um, I feel bad about myself when I do poorly in sport. Sport is the only important thing in my life. I would be very depressed if I were injured and did not compete that would be under the categorization of negative respectability. So how it's scored, um, once the ath athletes answer all these questions, it'll be counted up um, being that the total scores would be 10 being the lowest or 40 being the highest. And, yeah. and then for my statistical analysis, um, the appropriate statistical analysis will determine the results. And for my hypothesis, individuals that have a stronger athletic identity are um, 
non-normative will experience more difficult outcomes from transition out of sport compared to normative athletes. And so for my potential limitations, I'm not doing a, um, there's no clinical diagnosis. It's just, I wanna just get that um, information just from simply the athlete's responses because I feel like that's a better way for them to be able to express their opinion and um, also just giving them a voice at the end of the day. Um, and then potential participants may have moved out of the area for graduation. So even though I would be going to, I would stay around the Western Mass area, that's where I'm from, but uh, some other athletes or, um, yeah, some other athletes are not from there. And participate, participants may not be able to be up for the interview, just the lifestyle that they live and jobs or any obligations that they have. And then also considerations for a difficult topic to talk to among strangers. I can understand that it's not easy to be vulnerable in that sense, especially when you um, have gone through something that's difficult. So I think you have to just um, respect that decision from somebody and understand that you know it's you know it's it's hard to do that. But these are my references, and thank you guys again. I really appreciate you guys coming out and any questions. <laughs>
helps so much. I can't even I can't even stress that how much that is so important. So just putting yourself out there, even though it's a little uneasy at first, but it's certainly beneficial. Yes. Some of have questions. Well, just to like kind of continue the question. So the NCAA itself has resources for athletes that are transitioning from being an athlete to going into their job career setting. So even on like the website itself, NCAA.org, there's yeah. a resource tab for former collegiate student athletes to find resources that might apply to them in their situation. So um, yes, like there's definitely a continuity. I mean, feel free to locate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, there's a, a really good one, Victoria Garrick, I don't know if you're familiar with her, she's a former swimmer. Um, Athletes Connected is another group of literally college former athletes that are, you know, collaborating in, in discussion, you know, um, forums and posts and they get together and they talk about things that they're facing. Um, more from like a mental health aspect, yeah. obviously, because it is so awesome. relevant now. Yeah. Um, and there's actually a, a study, um, and I'd have to go back, back and find the, the author and the exact title, but there's a study that was performed um, on how much more employable former NCAA student athletes are mm -hmm. than non-student athletes. Mm -hmm. So um, in retention rates, in the amount of money that they're making, their retirement yeah. accounts, so there's, there's actual proven data that shows you know, you, you are more than your athletic career, but your athletic career prepares you for life in so many other ways. So yeah. it is hard for it to transition, but there is so many other resources and ways to, to continue on using your skills as a, as a former athlete. Right, right. Really good points. Yes? Did you come across any evidence looking at sort of those lifelong sports like tennis or running versus sort of those time-limited like football, field hockey? Yeah. Um, and how the student athlete transition comes yeah. about. You know, I actually did not come across that. I don't want to uh, say anything where I don't I don't know. So, um, but that is a good question, and I don't think you know I'm trying to come back to that one. <laughs> yes. and it just becomes, and 
that was something that I faced. So I didn't think, and I wasn't prepared for that, like, either. So I think, but as an athlete, you're constantly on the go, that sometimes you just need that little, but don't be like me and be mom and everyday <laughs> thing. <laughs>